This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Bingo, we're back. <laughs> Welcome back to Think Tech, okay? This is Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Every Wednesday at 4 p.m. We are so happy to do this show. I was telling Peter, it's my favorite show. Uh, he says I say that to everybody. <laughs> That's Peter Rosick on my left, spokesman for Hawaiian Electric. Hey. And co-host for the show is Mitch Ewan, who is going to introduce Terry Searles. Aloha, y'all. This is Terry Searles, my buddy from uh, formerly from HNEI and now with uh, the uh, California Institute of Environment and Energy. Energy, got it. <laughs> okay, we're going to talk about storage in California in a few minutes. Lessons learned. But first, hot news top down. Seven, count them, seven contracts for relatively cheap clean energy. What's going on, Peter? Well, we've talked about this a little before, but in last February we did an RFP uh, request for proposals. We got over 20, 24, 25 uh, proposals. We chose the seven. Ultimately, we found another an eighth. Uh, we chose the best ones, and we've just before the end of the year, we sent the contracts to the Public Utilities Commission for their consideration and approval. Uh, the, the headline, in a way, is it's the biggest infusion of renewable energy in the state's history, uh, some 260-plus megawatts. The 263. Two, there you go. I knew, I knew somebody was counting. And, uh, but in addition, they're all solar with storage. So each one of them can store about four hours of solar uh, during the day when there's a lot too much for us to use. And, and we can uh, use that in the afternoon and evening, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock to 9 o'clock, when we have the greatest demand. And, of course, the sun is not shining. And on top of that, the prices are the lowest in the history of renewable energy here in the state. And that has created a lot of sensation on the mainland. Uh, one of the headlines in the energy news uh, business was this is mind boggling because our average fossil fuel cost um, is about 15 cents a kilowatt hour. And you know, we don't take a profit on this, we don't mark it up, it's whatever it costs us to get this energy or, get, or to buy the, the fuel to get this energy. And now these prices are coming in at eight to ten. One of them is a little bit more expensive, but basically in the in the eight to ten cents a kilowatt hour range, compared to that fifteen cents. And um, four of the projects are on Oahu, where they will make a substantial uh, contribution. But especially on the neighbor islands, on Maui and the Big Island, they don't have any large scale. Uh, solar, they have wind, mm -hmm. and now they're going to get this infusion of low cost. Uh, solar that's going to really, I think, make a difference for them. Uh, it's going to change the way energy is is operated and the systems are going to operate on the neighbor islands. They're used to dealing with wind farms and with some uh, geothermal on Hawaii Island, but mostly balancing out the wind farms against their conventional power plants. Now they're going to get a lot of solar. And, and during the evening as well. So mm -hmm. uh, we're going to see, you know, from our point of view, it's going to be a great change on those islands. But from the customer's point of view, these are the largest solar, largest renewable projects on those islands, cheapest by far. Um, you know, Big Island's always had a lot of renewables, but they've also had some old prices. This is going to change the average. Change the rates, you think? Change the rate. I, I think they'll see us, you know, the rates are subject to a lot of things, not just the price of fuel, but in the price of fuel category, I think this will definitely make make a difference. A big question. Well, a couple of questions. One is, um, is it approved? Uh, it's with the Public Utilities Commission. Uh, we never speak for the Public Utilities Commission. We're very optimistic and we're very hopeful. They have been involved every step of the way. Uh, they knew these were coming. They helped us get them in before the end of the year so they could take advantage of federal tax credits. They've been very, uh, I don't want to say helpful, they, they, I think they may get upset, but they, they've been very receptive. When we had a problem on the Big Island, you know, last May we lost Puna Geothermal Venture. It's going to come back someday, we don't know when. We went back to the commission and said, can we have, can we go for another project on the Big Island to help keep that Big Island at a high renewable level and, and level out the prices? What's the timeline? In other words, if you had approval in a week or two or whatever, how long would it take to, to put them in the ground, have them operating? We think they'll be in operation before the end of 2022, which, you know, is, is for these kinds of things, it's relatively fast. Mm -hmm. uh, I, it's, it's, uh, 
you know, speedy by the definition of utility projects. Uh, it would be a big help if it came in, you know, a little earlier. But before the end of, the, of that year, I think we'll definitely see those those in operation. We have a 2020 uh, 30 percent renewable energy milestone to hit yet. These obviously will not contribute to that directly, but it will pave the way for the, the next milestone after one, that. One last question, Peter, sure. and that is, you, know, you talk about how it's, the price is lower. Yeah. It's quite remarkable and get buzz on the mainland about it, but what happened to make it lower? What, what are the factors that drove it down that way? Well, a number of factors. Uh, mainly, first of all, we have a new kind of contract, uh, and it, it allows, um, you know, the big risk if you're doing a solar project is that it might be curtailed. In other words, the, the, the utility, because there's no, not enough demand, might not be able to take all the electricity coming off the system. Well, so the, the storage helps to uh, alleviate that. And the contract we have established, it's a new one. And uh, again, in the wonky world of, of utility contracts, it's getting a lot of attention. But it reduces the risk of curtailment. And once that risk is removed, the developer can reduce prices without taking a chance on losing money. And the other factor, as I mentioned, uh, there is a federal uh, tax credit for renewable projects. Uh, at the end of last year, at the end of 2018, it began to decline. Mm -hmm. So anything that was on the books, that was in, in the works officially by the end of uh, 2018, could qualify for mm -hmm. that. So there so again, you got in before that we, deadline. We got in, again, we had seven uh, contracts. Uh, seven different, well, four or five different developers, and each one, each project is a little different. But we were able to come together and, and uh, create that, uh, those contracts, get them into the PUC on time, and so those are the the main factors. And and the fact that there was such a a vibrant co competition from the competitive bidding, everybody that was bidding knew that they had to make the price. Yeah. They were going to be in contention for a number of factors, but price is always uh, going to be one of them. So I think they all sharpened their pencils, as we say, and said, you know, what's the given these new circumstances, given these reduced costs and reduced risks, how low can we go? And the result was very, very positive. So whatever we learn from this particular experience, we try to reduplicate those same factors going forward and get that price or even better. Right. Uh, your witness, Mitch. <laughs> oh, over to Terry. Well, it was so sorry. apropos. No, that, it was so apropos that we had Peter on first talking about uh, you know uh, solar with uh, storage, and here we have an expert in that with Terry Searles uh, from California, who's wanted to talk about solar and storage on the uh, on the uh, California grid and lessons learned. So we have a series of slides. I'm going to turn it over to Terry. And okay. Just work your way through your slide deck. Okay. Well, you know, first of all, uh, I, it, it, I am, I'm here, I'm working as a consultant for HNEI, that's why I'm back. And uh, some Jay, I know, might remember I was here as interim uh, uh, administrator for remember, the uh, state energy office uh, in two years chair. ago, sitting in this very chair talking <laughs> about these things. But uh, so I'm back and forth now. I, my, my primary work in uh, in, at CPUC, California Public Utility Commission, is more oriented towards demand response. But we, there are components of storage there, obviously. In, in California these days, yeah. do they do they talk talk much about PG and E? Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just wondering. Just wondering. <laughs> uh, it's off topic here, but uh, let's put it this way. Uh, I live on the north coast up on Mendocino, and, and we've had uh, planned outages on big wind days. And, and I have to admit, what PG&E was thinking when they didn't shut everything off for this uh, campfire that destroyed the town of Paradise, I, I don't know what they were thinking. Because, because like I say, we've had smaller wind events towards the Mendocino coast where I live, and. We had no electricity, mm. but we didn't care. I mean, there was no electricity because they, you know, they, you know. I think there are going to be some dramatic uh, effects of all of that. Well, there will be uh, un uncertain. Yeah, it would be the best way to yeah. look at it at this. Sorry, time. I interrupted. No, you. no, that's Sorry. okay. So, uh, so I, I guess going on from there, we can go on to whatever slides you want to. Uh, oh, you went back to the original. You didn't. Ah, well, my, I sent them the changed one, but oh, uh, didn't, okay. didn't well, get in the slide deck. I, actually, the, uh, 
the 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 new title I've, that I've used in the past, because going back to being in this energy business since the early mid '70s, is uh, the title is uh, "Be Back Soon." I'm off to the 30 Years War, and and the reason being is th this is just an ongoing slog, and uh, and and you know for people looking for silver bullets, uh, panaceas that things can be solved quickly. Um, that's that's to the uh, that's to the uh, in the form of being delusional. So uh, so that's that's why I use that as a subtitle. But at any rate, moving on, um, the uh, this AB twenty five fourteen is the legislation that mandated one point three gigawatts of uh, storage to be installed by the investor owned utilities in California, and that's PG and E. Southern California Edison and San Diego Gas and Electric. And since then, well, it talks about the genesis. I'm not going to walk through these slides, but the point is it went in place. The, it was a legislative mandate. CPUC adopted it and, and effectively, you know, called out the 1.3 megawatt goal and, um, and, and went from there. 13, and this one is 1,300. Is that, is that really... Mm, practical for the legislature to oh. get into exactly how much storage should have right down to the the gigabyte like they that. they actually it, it wasn't that prescriptive uh, what CPUC came up with when we first when I first saw this they were using proprietary models from two different places so you didn't it was black box stuff and and not only did they call out for the 1300 megawatts, but they basically said, here's the amount that each of you, you will use for transmission, each of you will use for distribution, and each of you will use for behind the meter. Yeah, my, my point is, so, wouldn't, wouldn't the uh, commission be a better, um, or the regulator be a better place for, for that to come from? Because they carry the oh, expertise, yeah. presumably, but the legislature? Well, no, legislatures I, don't carry the expertise, sir. Well, no, there you you develop any one of a number of dataless, uh, you know, laws. Uh -huh. I mean, that's true, you know, on a federal level. It's true on a state level, and you know that just that just happens. I mean, my favorite example, going back to the early uh, two thousands uh, when I was loaned in, is that uh, Gray Davis. Uh, said, well, we're going to have 20% uh, renewables by 2010. And, and of course, you, you know, I said right then, it was like 2002 or three. I said, you, you're not going to achieve it. And we didn't. And, and the reason you didn't achieve it is the infrastructure wasn't there, the technology wasn't there, the, the costs were exorbitant. And, and also, in, in the end, for this law being passed, there were no penalty associated with it. So 2010 came and went. You know, they didn't achieve the goals, but then they set these new goals. Now, times have changed, right? As Peter has talked about, you know, the, uh, the prices of PV have come down dramatically. I mean, on the mainland, where you don't have to worry about storage backup because you still have thermal ramping, is that, is that some of the new um, projects coming out in Arizona and Nevada are on the order of two cents a kilowatt hour you know, for utility scale storage. So, so, but the legislature does these things. You know, I'm, I'm involved in a thing now with the CPUC where they've legislated expedited dispute resolution between the utility that doesn't want to interconnect and the people that want to interconnect. And, and basically there's been a lot of foot dragging. So the utility, or there can be foot dragging. And, and so basically the legislature said, this is going to stop and we're going to have expedited Dispute resolution. Mm, so that's kind right of where we are. So well, yeah, they get down and dirty. And and you know, let's face it. I mean, it, it happens here in Hawaii too. It's not it's not just California. So. Mm, I still like Hawaii better. Yeah. Well, whatever. <laughs> so so at any rate, the, going yeah, don't, back. Don't say that. Because, yeah. Because Mitch wants to speak to us all now. He wants to tell us it's about time to take a break. <laughs> I, I, I bet you five. That's what he has to say. It's time to take a break. <laughs> nice job. <laughs> <laughs> Was that peppy enough? Very nice. <laughs> this is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion.
nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way. There's got to be solution. How to make a brighter day. What do we do? We've got to give a little love, have a little hope, make this world a little better. Make it a better Try a little more, harder than before. Hello, I'm Yukari Kunisue. I'm your host of New Japanese Language Show on Think Tech Hawaii, called Konnichiwa Hawaii, broadcasting live every other Monday at 2 p.m. Please join us, where we discuss important and useful information for the Japanese language community in Hawaii. The show will be all in Japanese. Hope you can join us every other Monday at 2 p.m. Bingo, we're back. Mitch, will you agree with me when I say we're back? We're back. Okay, we're back. <laughs> Let's see if we can pick up where we left off. Oh, P.S., Peter Rosick went back to his office. Um, there's a lot more to discuss with him. We'll do that at a later time. Thank you, Peter. Okay, Mitch, why don't you continue with Terry and see if you can pick up where we left off. Okay, so Terry, why don't we uh, flip to the next slide? Okay, the next slide. The, all the other slide had said um, was, um, all the other slide had said was all the other things that, have, that the legislature has developed uh, since the, the initial AB 2514 was passed. The, and actually, because we were talking about this, right? Um, that the problem is you, you sometimes have the development of dataless legislation. You have regulations and legislation that get passed that are effectively counterproductive and contradictory to one another. So what we characterize this is that you can end up with a dog's breakfast of conflicting rules. So one of the problems is, is that even though you're pushing for more storage, there are other things that may inhibit you from getting there. And in addition, there's other technologies that may allow you to do what you want to do with storage that, that actually, um, like demand response technologies that where you don't really need to meet, meet the goal of the 1300 well, megawatts I mean, of storage. So who's, I guess the legislator is, legislature by setting the amount of storage is also telling us how long the storage should last, whether no. it be overnight. No. Well, who's telling us that? No, and, they, they, and, and, and is, that's a moving target, isn't it? Yeah. Because the technology changes and PS, I don't want to mention anything you don't know, but extreme weather is coming. Yeah, and and that's going to change the the algorithm, don't you think? Oh sure, sure. Um, so you know some of the things that that you can even actually this is discussions we're having here when you look at at, at microgrids and so there's so California is investing a lot of um, development money in looking at microgrids and where that might go, and and the the deal with the microgrids is, you know. Will it cost more? Will it cost less? Is it good for some people, bad for others? And a lot of it gets down, we don't know. But, the, but what you want to do is to improve resiliency. So where do you want to improve resiliency? And the preference is around emergency services. Mm. So, you know, there are microgrid projects around hospitals. There are microgrid projects around CAL FIRE facilities. So things like that, that, that you know, you have a disaster happen. And, um, and uh, you, you will then, you then still have your emergency services operating because you've developed a microgrid that, can, that would be islanded from Can you explain home. how that works? I mean, why would the existence, and how would the existence of a microgrid around a hospital, uh, you know, better deal with, um, let's say, extreme weather, better well, deal with something that would, um, that would um, you know, pull the rug out from under yeah. the existing grid? Well, power goes out. Right, the, okay. the grid the grid goes down, or at least the grid goes down in the region you're in, and and but you want these emergency facilities to be operating. So you you establish a microgrid, and I, I, I will admit I don't know all the details of these microgrids that uh, the California Energy Commission is funding, but basically, you know they're looking at some one of the key issues is is how do you deal with emergency services mm. where you can where your power goes out. But it doesn't go out where you're. I, I guess I see what what it is. I mean, the the hospital is connected to the larger grid. <clears throat> the larger grid fails, or the connection from the larger grid to the hospital fails. But the the hospital has its own source of power. Right. And right. with the microgrid, it can deliver that power to any 
any right. part of the hospital. Yeah, so simplistically, when people think about this in the old days, just a backup generator. But you know, now you want to look at it with different kinds of things based on what your local resources are. So it could be solar with, with storage backup. It, it could be even as you're developing more small wind, small wind with storage backup, you can still have a backup generator. So the whole, the whole idea is to uh, protect your emergency activities. And the emergency activity is larger these days. Oh, sure. You know, a hospital uh, back in 1940 would have been one building. Right. Now it's a, it's a city it's a, block. It's a complex. And you, and you need more than an emergency generator that would cover one building. You need a system that would cover all of them, hence the microgrid. Exactly. Am I doing the right thing? Has yeah. HNEI got involved in this, Mitch? Yes, we do. We have a microgrid group at uh, HEI, headed up by Leon Roos, and we do a lot of microgrid work, and we do a lot of this kind of evaluation of uh, what it should look like and how it should interface with your regular grid. So, so the question is, can California learn from you, or can you learn from California? I think a little bit of both. I mean, I don't want to presume that uh, we know more than California, but we have some smart people here, too, and they're doing some good work, particularly uh, in some of the other uh, in the Asia-Pacific region as well. So they're coming to us for our knowledge, so. Okay. All right, do you have another slide you want to discuss? Yeah, well, let's kind of move on. Like we did the dog's breakfast one. Which is my favorite. And, and, you know, this is some of the things. It's just we're now set. The, the renewable goals are 60% by 2030. And uh, the, uh, in California, that does not include large head hydro because... Um, and it does not include behind the meter generation of PV. You mean from households? From household, well, or commercial, yeah. whatever, right. but behind the meter. Right. So, okay, next slide. Um, and, the, and this shows the, uh, this is what I just said, you know, the, the growth is substantial, and, but, it, but, the, the, but, you know, again, behind the meter generation is what you get and you can have right now as much as five gigawatts of behind the meter generation on a, on a sunny day, but that doesn't count towards the uh, RPS percentages. Next slide. And this, this simply gives you a, um, uh, the aggregated amount of renewables. Now, you probably read where California is looking for 100% uh, fossil free um, electricity by 2045. So just like um, just like Hawaii, the once they get there, they would be counting all large head hydro, you know, because you're you're not going to get there without that. Okay, next slide. Next slide. Okay. Now one of the one of the impacts on the mainland, and and I and I know this is something Peter left, but he, 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 we could talk about this is that you're generating so much electricity during the, um, the middle of the day, be either utility scale or, or behind the meter, that you got to keep the thermal units running. You can't shut them down and then restart them to deal with the evening peak. So the, these thermal units are effectively selling their electricity e either at below what it costs them to generate, or, or actually in some instances, negative prices. Can you help me with thermal unit, what is that? A natural gas combined cycle, mm, okay. uh, or even a, even a geothermal up in, uh, up in uh, the geysers. Let me interrupt you to, to wrap and, up. And the nuclear power plant at the oh, oh, Canyon. Oh, we don't talk much about that here. Yeah, right. <clears throat> uh, but uh, let me interrupt you about this. Uh, it, it seems to me that as we go forward, some of the, uh, what do we call it, uh, the alternative uh, sources that we were considering earlier go away. They, they, don't, they don't survive the market process. They, they're just not relevant anymore. They're not, they're not happening, and so we drop them off. So it's changing. Yeah. The, 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 the portfolio is changing. Sure. And I wonder, you know, what we are learning. I mean, I'm really asking you both. What are we learning about how those changes should be recognized and adopted and maybe even reinforced? Some things just... We, we, we know they don't work, so we should drop them off. And, and I think there was a time, maybe still, uh, where we had this idea that maybe X source was useful and, and we argued for diversity and we argued for a, a multifaceted um, you know, portfolio. There comes a time when you have to drop 
the losers off. So are we learning about that? Are we doing that? Anybody? Well, you know, I, I mean, all I can talk about is the continental U.S. And, and basically, I was having this, this discussion with somebody else today, is that even in states that mine coal, so like Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania. Yeah, I don't they, shop there. They, but they are, but coal-fired power plants are being retired there. And they're basically being replaced by natural gas combined cycle plants because they're just cheaper to run. Yeah. I mean, they are, you know, a lot of the control technologies you got to, forgetting about climate change, and a lot of control technologies you got to put in place uh, for coal fired power plants is all about particulates, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxides, mm -hmm. et cetera. And, and so you really have to, uh, those are costly to maintain and operate. Yeah. So natural gas the combined cycle is, first of all, the efficiency is way better. I mean, a good coal-fired power plant will be in the mid-30s efficiency, and, and combined cycle, natural gas combined cycle will be over 60%. So, it, so 60 that's... 60% of what? Uh, well, you know, of, the, of the total energy used. I mm -hmm. mean, 40% is still wasted energy, but mm -hmm. as, a, as opposed to... a Coal-fired power plant, 65% is effectively wasted energy. So it's a, well, it's what's a, your answer to the question, Mitch? The question? Well, yeah, what are we learning about dropping non-producers, non-producing well, sources Well, some of them are off? just, they're just falling off naturally, like Terry said. I mean, you know, it's just that technology is better. I mean, you know, we, we went from steam locomotives to diesel locomotives, not because it was necessarily cheaper, but it was more convenient to be fueling the engines uh, with uh, diesel fuel rather than having to shovel coal into them. I'll give you an yeah. example. Um, OTEC or Wave Energy. Now, th they're still in development. There's still a lot of money going to try to develop them, right? Uh, maybe HNEI is developing or trying to develop these well, things. Well, we're working with both of those, yeah. yeah. So w how they're... long do you continue doing that when they're not in the marketplace and, you know, I mean, I don't know how, what it looks like in terms of their, um, their uh, competitive efficiency, but what's the analysis? Well, they're very early technologies. I mean, they're really, we're just doing little pilot plants, so we haven't really actually operated full scale, so we don't actually know enough to make that kind of a decision. And uh, if you look at the amount of energy that humanity needs, we're going to need everything. So, you know, we can't just arbitrarily throw something out the door because, like, today it's like brand new technology right out of the, hardly even out of the egg. We're going to throw that away before, you know, inventive people figure out better ways to do it. For example, the OTEC plant, they've developed a new heat exchanger that's improved efficiency by a factor of 25 times. This is in uh, Nelha. At Nelha, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's huge. And that's a game changer. And so how many other game changers are out there that we don't know about yet? I so mean, you every, can't drop them off too soon you because you may lose the benefit of technological advances that are just about to happen. Exactly. You have to have confidence. You have to yeah. have optimism yeah. all that. Yeah. 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 And like, who's we? Who's going to drop it off? It's the market that's going to make the decision. Right. Yeah. You know? yeah. Including the market that funds the research. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah. You know, there's enough people that have confidence in, for example, WAVE, and OTEC, they're still funding it. Yeah. Right. Terry, we're almost done. So can you sort of shape your final thoughts and takeaway <laughs> to our audience? Well, we've been all over the map on this. So, so um, you know, we, we actually never really talked about storage. So that, but that's OK. You know, I think that, uh, you know, getting back to your question is probably a more important way to close this out because um, you know we we have to be prepared for change and um, we we know that things will change we don't know how things will change and and the, the work we've done this was something when I was working with the uh, governor's office two years ago that um, we were we were, we pointed out that when why clean energy initiative was started we were going to put in these uh you know huge wind farms on molokai and i well we we never did that but in the meantime we're achieving our goals of our renewable portfolio standard goals because we um we because of the price of pv plummeting to the point where it is now 
the, uh, the, the issue with storage, and I, I'm going to get, I might as well point that out a little, is, is that if, if you look at technology trajectory for the time being, how do we get to the 40% in 2030? It's really going to be a lot more solar. You know, it, there may not be much wind. We're not considering inter-island cabling. So it's going to be more solar, and at a certain point, you're, you are going to need storage. And storage has a couple problems. Okay, number one, it's expensive. It's not as expensive as it used to be, but it's still expensive. And because you're going to get to a certain point where you have so much solar with the, with the way we were talking about it, that, that I, and this is a, an HNEI analysis that, uh, that you basically are going to need four kilowatt hours of storage for every kilowatt of uh, PV you're putting in place. Now, do, you, do we need that right now? Actually, no. But, I'd rather know, have too much than too little. Time. Right, right. But it's uh, well, it's costly to put in too much now, and and you know, particularly if you're doing utility scale, um, you it's know, the consu costly. consumer advocate has to approve these mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, if you if you're not installing these things as you move along, which which is what they're trying to do, you're going to find that uh, you don't have enough storage. And, and you get into curtailment problems. Well, why don't you just go out and buy more batteries? It can't be that complicated, can it? <laughs> yes, it can. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Mitch, uh, you know, how, how do you want to wrap this up with Terry? We need a takeaway here. Um, well, takeaway is uh, this yeah, is a ahead. difficult problem. And it takes a lot of brain power to get it right. You don't want to jump too soon because if you make a mistake, it's really a, an expensive mistake. You throw out technology, you invest in huge batteries that might not work. And, uh, you know, we can't afford to waste money. We can't afford to waste time. We've got to be smart. Yeah. And that's why we yeah. call our project over in the H&R the Smart Grid Project. So there you right. go. Right. That, that we started in, in, in 2007 on Maui. The other thing, the other thing we, it, it's worth noting is that one of the things we're trying to do in California, and one thing that the U.S. DOE office of the storage, you know, office is doing is, how do you how do you move other storage technologies to the front of the line? The problem is everything's expensive, and while lithium ion is expensive, they they clearly have uh, taken over. But in the long run, and this gets back to you know what Mitch just said about OTEC. You can't stop funding these things because when might there be a significant breakthrough in a way that allows these other, you know, redox storage systems to have a breakthrough and become much cheaper? To leapfrog. To, to, to leapfrog, and it's leapfrogging in terms of uh, the, the capabilities, the operations, and the cost. Yeah. And, and, you know, at this point, we... There's a, there's a lot of work going on out of DOE and in Washington looking at other storage, um, other redox systems to, to get yeah. at these things. So one saying we had in submarines was never get uh, sold on one, on one solution. There you go. And that, you and go. that pervades our thinking, it should. Yes. You know, it's so nice to see you, Terry. It's been yeah, a while. good seeing you and again. I must say, we, you know, I regret that you went to California. I suppose things, you know, there well, are beneficial things. I know there must be something in California that's yeah, good. Yeah, like my wife. And you're enjoying yeah, that. So, yeah, it's very right, important. Right, but I want yeah. to point out to you, although we didn't get into detail about this, there are two big jobs open in Hawaii. I just need you to know this. You know, one is they're still looking for another PUC commissioner. And the other is uh, our friend uh, Brennan Morioka went over to the College of Engineering at UH, leaving the electrification of transportation job open at Hawaiian Electric. I just want to point that out to you. Yeah. You know, it's not too late to consider those possibilities. What do you think, Terry? Well, that's interesting. The, you know, the PUC thing, we, you know, as I said, I, I was, uh, before we got here, you know, I was talking to people about, you know, who, who might be the person and stuff. But when you get to transportation, I'm not a transportation guru. I'd leave that. Let let Mitch take that job. So there you go. Yeah. Okay, and that's where we'll leave it for now. <laughs> <laughs> Mitch, you and thank you so much, Terry Searles. Hey, thank thanks. you so Good much. Thanks. Good seeing you again. Oh, hi, you guys. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>